Wake up! I'm Doug and this is the Taste and Sensibility channel. And here today on coffee review number 22, we're looking at a single origin coffee from Sumatra. Where is Sumatra? I'm going to show you in my favorite book, Coffee Obsession, but just an overview of the next five coffees that all come from this region, which is basically Indonesia. So the string of islands here includes Sumatra, which is today's. There's Java. There's a flat, tiny little thing called Bali that's you hardly notice. It's not, the word Bali is bigger than the island there. And then Sulawesi. And then over here, Papua New Guinea will be the next several coffees that we do. And the Coffee Obsession book, wonderful book by Manette, Annette Malvaire has a page on Sumatra, two pages, look, a two-page spread, and lots of descriptions of the different coffee growing areas and regions and what they grow in each spot. So the area for this coffee really comes from the northern growing region. There's another one down at the south, but it's up here in Asa, S Asa. And now, oh, I should have poured it. Okay, got them poured and cooling off. And this Sumatra that I ordered unroasted from Smoking Beans is one of my first bags and it's got the old label in it. So I've had this for a couple of years. And it doesn't have the uh, information that's on the current labels. So I printed that out separately so I could read it off. But this apparently did not appeal to me very much. I bought a four pound bag two or three years ago. And uh, I haven't finished it. So there was something different about this. I think it was more earthy, more savory, less sweet and fruity. Or the fruit was more processed or deeper or wine-like or something that made it very different than the Central American coffees I really, really liked at first. So I still have some of this. And it did. And I roasted this batch very recently. Three days ago, it says here. And they're a nice dark brown. I was really shooting for something a little darker because I've had Sumatra from Trader Joe's. It came in a can. I did an in grocery store episode. And they are really dark and oily and they smelled great. And I love the taste of the coffee. So I was trying to get close to that, but I, uh, beans like this run away with you at the end. So you're always, you know, should I go another five seconds? Should I go another 10 seconds? It's hard to judge. So these came out dark enough, they smell good, and the coffee, the brewed coffee, smells pretty good. But they're not quite as darkly roasted as I was shooting for, but it shouldn't be a big deal. I should be able to taste everything just fine. So I am setting the bag over there, be out of the way. And hopefully I can start smelling and tasting the coffee soon. Oh wow, yes, deep and rich, dark. So the uh, less than uh, great labeling on this first bag I got didn't tell me that much about the farm, the co-op, uh, the growing region where this came from. So here's a little bit about the coffee from the Smoke and Beans website. So this applies to the current stuff, but I don't think they've changed suppliers at all. High grown beans from Sumatra are considered as the region's finest and are certified fair trade grade one. They are a staple in coffee shops around the country as single origin offerings and are used extensively in blends, adding body and earthy spice, spice notes to the blend. Indonesian beans tend to handle heat very well without becoming bitter, making them a popular choice for darker roasts. So they're often in espresso and dark things. This particular crop was grown at 1,200 to 1,300 meters from the plant varieties of Jember, Ateng, and Bourbon. The processing has been a wet hulled process, which locally is called Gilling Basa, or some similar thing. And the farmers are Bernie Bias, pronunciation questionable, of course, or just wrong. 
and, which is a big co-op, really, and Alam, Alamsaya. And then I looked up the Bernie Bias co-op and got a little more information about them there. So the group was started in 2004 from the Gaia Highlands in the northern tip of Sumatra. There were 866 coffee farmers from the area at the time of this printing or website posting, 20% of whom are women. So this came about after a decade-long internal project in cooperation with the some coffee companies with big long names, working with farmers in the region, offering help and infrastructure with coffee production. And they were finally starting to see this in 2015 when this date was given. Looks like it. It's a large area with a lot of production and they can supply several roasters around our country, around the world. Lots of coffee is going out of this area as a single origin specialty coffee. Ooh, getting a little deeper and richer as it cools off, so I'm not going to be able to resist anymore. Wow earthy but not muddy or dirty it's a kind of a spicy baking spices kind of note i'm looking for fruit looking for sweet and they are kind of hidden yes there's this whole mix of different spice notes in the middle in the mid palette So it might be a cinnamon, it might be an allspice or a clove, nutmeg or cardamom. It's a mixture of different things. They're subtle. They're moving around the, the earthiness at the bottom. So I'm looking for cocoa notes. It's hard, it's hard to pick out anything. Looking for sweetness or fruit, I'm not getting sweet. There might be some dark fruits in there. Plum, raisin. Wow, really nice. Very well, nice structure. I mean, everything's lined up and pleasant and not very muddy. There's an earthiness, but it's not, it's not a dirty one. It's a clean one. It's the only way I can think of to describe it just glorious there's a kind of a tartness or acidity to it too that's a little surprising it's not usually in this kind of earthy coffee but i think it's there wow nice 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 this is so different than the trader joe's which was roasted darker and just tasted dark this these notes are coming out very nicely Me give you a few more tasting notes. The smoking beans usually give some, and I usually ignore them until the end. So smoking beans says plum, wine, strawberry, orange, sweet and smooth. And I'm not really picking up orange or sweet or strawberry, but plum and wine are good descriptors because you can be kind of vague and ambiguous. And then let's see, let's go to the Sumatra, the Bernie Bia's website. Okay, the aromas of plum and cedar. Ah, there was a cedar-like note that was kind of woody, not very food-like. Yeah, cedar's a good note. Gave way to a smooth acidity and velvety mouthfeel and notes of Australian Shiraz. Aromatic pipe tobacco. Yeah, I can see that, but I wouldn't think of it. A hint of clove. Still some traditional qualities of peat moss. So they're claiming a vegetal note, but not so much as to be just distracting and off-putting. And then in the cup they say cedar, pipe tobacco, dry spice, red wine, ripe red plum. So those are good descriptions, but I'm not sure I would, I wouldn't say half of those things. 
and I understand what they mean, and I understand all those things except the fruits, the strawberry, orange. There is a brightness that someone might uh, interpret as citrus. So this is wonderful at this roast level. If it's the same kind of stuff that's in Trader Joe's, then that's all. It gets more interesting or, it, it, no, let's not say that. Let's say it handles the roasting well when it goes darker. You still get some complexity. So I've been remembering that Trader Joe's for a while. So I probably didn't roast this very well at the beginning and maybe that's what put me off of it or where I lost interest. But if you go dark to oily and shiny, where you're really hitting so that you can crack and breaking down the uh, bean structure, this comes out very well. So I'm a pretty poor roaster, hit and miss. Don't always hit what I want to and don't always know the best place to go to. But this one's working out well. I like this. And now I'm going to do the cream thing. Which I often claim turns into a caramely chocolate milk when they're Central American coffees. And I have no idea what's going to happen here. Put a good amount of cream. And let me find a spoon for stirring. I'll just throw the papers on the ground since I don't need them anymore. And see how it gets along with cream. The smell is really good. Wow. It does get caramely. You can smell the butterfat notes off of the half and half that I put in here. So there's cream, there's milk. It means I've added a little bit of lactose with the milk. So it would, should get sweeter to the taste. I get the creaminess on the palate. I get it in the taste. But I'm not sure it's really picking up the cocoa notes and turning those into a chocolate milk type mixture. It's just a nice creamy coffee. So that's different than lots have been. It is wonderful. So this is you know, it gets four stars, five stars, whatever a rating system is. Give it, give it all of them, even though I roasted it. That's great. And the second topic today is going to be decaf coffee. What is caffeine? How do you get it out of the beans? And does it taste any good when you do? And I chose this episode because I've got a couple of Sumatran coffees in that uh, decaffeination portion. So that'll be coming up soon. But the flavor on the Sumatra coffee is just wonderful. So remember that when you go out shopping or sit at your computer or phone and shop. Okay, so here we are at the five-way decaffeinated coffee taste-off. Let me go through the contestants. Here we have a smoke and beans half decaffeinated Sumatra. So it is the same label as their normal Sumatra bag nowadays. But it has a little sticker here that says half caffeine. So they apparently have some gentle process where they don't change any of their, I think it's probably in-house for them. So they don't change any of their tasting notes or any details about the coffee, but they offer it as half decaf. The counterpart over here is a half decaf Ethiopian Guji from, from Smoking Beans also. And it's got the half decaf sticker on a normal bag. So those are the should be most like a single origin and the least processed, the least damaged, the least uh, disturbed. There's a full decaf Sumatra coffee. I have Burman's 
mountain water process. So it'll be a good picture on the screen, but there's the one pound bag and these beans are dark. For unroasted beans, these are very green, very brown, splotchy, un-uniform, very questionable if you saw these, if you didn't know what they came from. And the counterpart over here is an Ethiopian fully decaf from Sweet Maria's. So you can see this better on the screen, but these are fairly dark. Ethiopia Kaffa Farmers Swiss Water Process Decaf. And then they say, see Ethiopia hardly tastes like decaf. So they're bragging on their process or bragging on the choices that they've made there. So two single origin Ethiopians, half decaf, full decaf. And then in the middle here, we have smoking beans, regular decaf Swiss water process. They say it's from South America, so they must have some idea that this coffee survives the decaffeination process better or brings its flavors through just fine. Or, and maybe it's a two-way, three-way blend. I don't know what it is. It just says it's from South America, light to dark roast. So uh, since it's hiding everything, I'll just drop the bag and just leave a, a little bag of beans on the table. So that's enough talking. I'm going to go through and do the cuppings. I've got 12 grams of ground coffee in each one. Just ground it a few minutes ago. And I've definitely labeled the back of the cups so I can't get anything confused. So I'm going to start in and start that timer. Okay, number one. Okay, four minutes is up. Stop. Do that. Get rid of the phone. Now I'm going to break in to each of these five. Going to stop the brewing process, let the ground settle, pick out floaters. And that'll take a while and that'll be boring, so I'll speed it up again. Okay, all the brewing's done, all the housekeeping's out of the way, so I'm going to go through and taste each one of these. So first one will be the smoking Beans Half Decaf Sumatra. So it should be the most like today's main coffee based on amount of processing. So it smells pretty deep and rich. Yes, it's that spicy complex, almost cedar-like note I got on the coffee of the day. It is hiding the spice notes a little bit more, the baking spices. They're in there, but I think they're not quite as bold as they were in the fully caffeinated coffee. Just, of course, there could be differences. These beans aren't, you know, they're about the same darkness. There's no specks of oil, but decaf coffees are harder to roast. I had to roast all five of these and you don't always have the same uh, feedback from the roasting process. They start out darker, you can't go by the color. They need to end up a little bit darker than they normally would. Uh, you have to go by first crack and pops and timing and what the whole thing feels like. That's a little bit harder to roast. I think I did okay and I think this is tasting like Sumatran. It's earthy but clean. There's a hint of cocoa at the back end. I'm 
still ambiguous about the fruity qualities or the wine-like qualities that people claim. And I'm not getting, it's in there, but I'm not sure that's the way I would characterize it. I think I know what they're talking about. Plumminess, Shiraz, dark fruits. So, yeah, that is good. It's hard to tell that anything's really happened to it. So, do a little palate cleanse. And I'll move on to the Berman Mountain Water Process, fully decaffeinated. So we're talking 99% caffeine removal here. It smells about the same way, maybe a tad more tart or bright. Hmm. Very close to the same character. There's a tartness or a brightness. It wasn't in the smoking beans. They may have a totally different uh, distributor, importer, grower, set of growers, co-op. I don't know where it came from, but it is mandolin. It is the same name as an identifier of the Sumatra Arabica beans that are in here. It's very similar. So if you like Sumatra, Wow, this is pretty close. So the unroasted beans turn out really dark. These have a few specks of oil. I hit second crack on some of them. And there's a few specks of oil on the beans. So these may be the most successfully roasted. This is the roast I was shooting for. And none of the other ones are quite that dark. Although they, I wasn't necessarily shooting for the dark roast, just for the Sumatras. And wow, this tastes really good. I'm surprised it's so similar and it certainly is muddy in here since there's been no filtration or separation of the brewed coffee from the beans and grounds so it is full of sediment and muddy there's a little bit of coat you know, tongue coating from the sediment and the fines but that tastes great that is the Sumatran plus a little bit of tartness or acid there's a little more brightness to it but otherwise the same stuff. Very interesting. Okay, this one is a South American single origin or blend, they don't say. I assume they're blending two or three things, or they might say more. It's a different aroma for sure than the two Sumatrans here. It might be more vegetal Maybe cereal or grain. There's a sweetness. There's a graininess to it, is what I would say most. And, hmm. A little bit of cocoa. It's not quite as earthy as the Sumatrans over here. There's a savory character to it. It's not really grainy and cereally on the palate. It's just on the nose and the what I'm getting is more of a savory note. Earthy, still pretty clean. It's not very muddy, even though it's physically muddy and unfiltered. It tastes very clean. I'm not sure I've tasted a single origin like quite like this. But I'm getting notes that are all uh, hitting my single origin registers. That's what I was hoping for in this, that I've tasted such a string of single origin coffees that I would be able to pick out the usual suspects. But without saying what South American country, it's, it's hard to pin down. It's a big area, big region. But I would be pretty happy with this as a single origin uh, regular, unprocessed, fully caffeinated coffee. So 
Don't know what it is. It's probably not my wheelhouse, but it's fine as a coffee. I would drink it if I had a bag and had to roast two pounds or four pounds and get through it, share it with people. I do all that, treat it like any other coffee that I'm exploring with. Now over here, I think I'll go all the way to the end and taste the half decaf smoking beans, Ethiopian Gucci. Mm, don't know what to make of the palate. A little earthy. Woody. Let's see. It's got lots of food nuts in it. Man, these are cooling off fast, so I'm tasting a lot. Wow. Complex. Variety of earthiness, vegetal. cocoa. There's a sweetness to it. There's a lot of savory in this. I'm not sure the sweetness is fruity. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to cheat and read their tasting notes. Citrus, floral, apricot, clean and bright. Ooh. not getting a real citrus but the apricot rings a bell I didn't connect with that yeah apricot which is a pretty subtle mild fruit in my book there's still an earthiness down at the bottom a savory character to it so, wow that just I love that that is great I'm gonna I'm gonna love the rest of this bag So yeah, that's good. It's kind of surprising. I've never had a Gucci before. Yeah, I tried to buy one locally and that was not available. So I was excited to buy it here and with less processing. So yeah, that strikes me as a fine single origin and it doesn't really taste processed or like it's missing anything. And now I'm going to compare it to a different kind of Ethiopian. I don't, it doesn't say Yurgachev, it says Kaffa farmers. Swiss water process, so fully decaffeinated. The roast is pretty dark, but I don't really see any specks of oil. Didn't quite make it to second crack, but it is dark, dark for me in my roasting. I was trying to move it along. Ooh, the same kind of character on the nose as the other Ethiopian. Maybe grainy, maybe lightly fruit, and a kind of earthiness. Wow, very similar. Having trouble telling the difference between this one and that one. No, I wouldn't expect them to be identical or even necessarily similar. Ethiopia is where <laughs> many, many coffee species and varieties uh, started. So it's full of oddballs and one-offs. You know, many heirloom varieties. I'm not getting a great deal different than this one. Let me cheat and look at tasting notes if there are any. And I can't read them upside down very well. Moderate body flavors, the caramelized fruit, brown sugar, dark chocolate, malt, spiced hints, and citrus rinds. There's a hint of acidity, but it's not striking me as citrus. There is kind of a, a maltiness to it. I'm not sure all those other things apply. It's earthy, a little tiny bit of cocoa. The fruit is hidden or caramelized or changed or darkened. And it's not sticking out very far. So it's an interesting single origin and I can't really tell that it's been damaged or changed by 
the decaffeination process. So overall, these do not taste any different than the single origin type things I've been tasting all along. This was the most questionable or the most baffling. These two Ethiopians taste very similar, even though there's no reason they, I think they're very different, maybe from different regions. And the Sumatrans were very similar to each other and to what I tasted today. So this South American blend, or I don't know if it's a blend or not, is the most uh, different and it's fine too. I'm not going to have any trouble drinking these other than not getting my caffeine. Maybe these will be my nighttime coffees because these three are fully decaf and I've got pounds and pounds of them. So they'll be after dinner coffees, I guess. Maybe I can experiment with coffee drinks and espresso. So again, let me remind you to like the video down below, leave a comment or question, subscribe to the channel and click that bell to get notified when the new videos come out on Mondays. So. I think that'll do it for now and uh, come back for more coffee. Okay, so I'd like to go through here on a few slides and explain the decaffeination processes that are used for decaffeination nowadays. But first, I want to explain caffeine. So this is the chemical structure of caffeine. You can see there's two rings with all these ends in here. These little corners without any letter are all carbon, and these methyl groups I hear also. But there's two nitrogens here in this ring and two in this ring, and then the oxygens are also important. And all these nitrogens make the caffeine taste somewhat bitter. So there, it's a basic compound, alkaline, and it has a bitter taste. And then all these oxygens and nitrogens are polar or well suited to dissolve in water. So the small molecule that's very polar wants to go into water when it gets a chance. And there's probably a thousand other compounds that come out into the water that we drink and that we call coffee. So uh, the coffee beans, the solid things that we roast or buy roasted, are on the order of one to one and a half percent caffeine if they're arabica and robusta beans can be two three four percent caffeine by weight so a lot of blenders or people doing coffee like the, the extra punch from the robusta beans extra caffeine okay so the first decaffeination method i want to look at is one of the oldest or the oldest but uh, the way it's done nowadays is to first steam or hydrate the bean, unroasted coffee beans somehow with water or steam and then put them in a chamber where you're going to mix it with a solvent. It's an organic solvent that takes some of the organic compounds out of the beans. If it's a good solvent for caffeine or some of the other flavor and aroma compounds, those uh, substances will go into the solvent to a great degree. So after maybe five or ten hours in the solvent, the uh, beans are filtered out, they're separated. So the solvent goes one way with dissolved caffeine and probably with a few flavor and aroma components. And then the beans are separated out, dried out, uh, separated from the solvent. And the solvents that are used nowadays tend to be methylene chloride and ethyl acetate. So methylene chloride is uh, not uh, looked at with uh, favor by a lot of people. It's chlorinated hydrocarbon which um, probably makes it tough on your liver although it's not actually in the beans to any great extent there's only a few traces in the beans after the processing by the decaffeination company the uh, traces then uh, will be dissipated in, during the roasting process these are very volatile compounds both of them and uh, you just aren't going to find very much in the unroasted beans. So methylene chloride is uh, not a friend to a lot of people, but ethyl acetate is a compound that is found in nature. It's simply an ester or a combination of ethyl alcohol and acetic acid. So vinegar and drinking alcohol are the two components that go into ethyl acetate. So although it's found in nature, it's found in lots of fruits and vegetables, the solvent that's actually used is industrially produced 
from uh, other chemical industry components. So what people don't like about it is that the beans come in contact with the solvents that they don't want to have any contact with their body. So that is a problem for some people. And then another, I guess another feature is that the dissolved caffeine is easy to separate and send on to the pharmaceutical industry. So the solvent can be recycled. Okay, so one thing that some people really didn't like about the direct solvent method was the interaction of the unroasted beans, the coffee beans, with the uh, solvent doing the extraction of the caffeine. So someone came up with a less direct process where the coffee beans do not contact the solvent. So again, we start out with a steamed or hydrated green coffee beans, and then you soak them in water. And this is really to pull out the water-soluble flavor and aroma constituents into the water so that the water is saturated with all those things. So the first time you run the beans through, or the first time you do this process on a batch of beans, the beans are actually discarded as flavorless shells of what they used to be. All the flavor and aroma components have gone into the water. This is done at a higher temperature. So the water's hot and extracting all those things from the green coffee beans. Then it, the beans are separated from the water and the water goes on. And this is the point where some, one of the solvents is added. Again, methylene chloride or ethyl acetate. So the beans have been pulled out of the process. Now the solvent is added. The next step along the path is a separation step where like the solvent, the methylene chloride is denser than water and does not mix with it. It's immiscible. It won't mix with the water, so it always falls to the bottom when water and methylene chloride are in a, in a container. The methylene chloride is always at the bottom. So you separate those two. The dissolved caffeine goes off with the solvent and some of the flavor and aroma compounds that are somewhat soluble in methylene chloride or ethyl acetate, they also go off. But the water fraction from that goes on to receive the next batch of unroasted beans. So these coffee beans aren't treated as badly as the first time through. The water is already saturated with coffee uh, flavors and aromas from unroasted beans, so no more comes out into the water. So the beans keep their flavor and aroma con compounds, and only the caffeine is being removed when the solvent goes through. Uh, that's the theory, anyway. The solvent is always pulling out some of the flavor and aroma compounds, so there's always a compromise here. So, and again, the same uh, warnings that go with methylene chloride and ethyl acetate as solvents for doing this extraction apply to this one. They don't touch the beans, but they touch the water that goes on to touch the beans. So uh, the people that objected would probably still object. But this is a current method that's done in Europe a lot. And methylene chloride is often used in Europe. Okay, now we're going to look at more modern processes for decaffeination where the beans contact only water and some activated charcoal or activated carbon. So again, we need to start out with steamed or hydrated beans that have been opened up somewhat in their structure. And then they bring in water and let that soak at a higher temperature. And the first pass through is sacrificial because what you're doing is putting flavor and aroma components from the beans, from the unroasted coffee beans, into the water so that it is basically saturated with the aroma and flavor components. So the beans that leave that chamber have been uh, depleted of all their aroma and flavor components. So it is sacrificial for the first batch of beans through the process. Whatever that batch size is, you lose that first one. But the flavors continue on and prevent more flavors from coming out of the beans later on. So the water, after the beans are separated here on the first pass, the water goes on and they call it green coffee extract in one of the processes. That's one of their names in the jargon. And this water containing caffeine and flavor and aroma components of the coffee go on to an activated charcoal filter or activated carbon. So something like an aquarium filter that's pulling out uh, unpleasant aromas and compounds or 
there are so many uses for activated charcoal that uh, certain of certain compounds just stick to it. The bigger they are, the more colored they are, the lots of uh, different chemical properties make things stick to the carbon and take it out of the system. So here, caffeine is preferentially chosen. Some flavor and aroma compounds stick a little bit to the carbon, but you don't lose very much. So mostly what comes out is caffeine. And then the water goes on to the next batch. So it is full, it's been depleted of caffeine, but it's still saturated for the most part in the flavor and aroma compounds. So the next batch of beans that come through, only caffeine is pulled out of the beans. The beans do not lose their flavor and aroma compounds to the water because it's already full. So that starts a cycle where uh, you don't sacrifice any more beans. So once that uh, water is soaked and comes to equilibrium with the uh, unroasted coffee beans, the beans that come out there have only lost caffeine. They have not lost their flavor and aroma compounds. So the green coffee extract with caffeine goes forward in the process. Again, goes through the activated carbon filter, activated charcoal, pulls out the caffeine preferentially. And then the uh, flavor water or green coffee extract goes on without the caffeine. So over here, you know, eventually the carbon is going to fill up and you have to change it out. But once you get it changed out, it is pretty easy to uh, recover the caffeine and uh, reactivate the carbon so it can be used again. So it just sets up the cycle. So every time you have a different small batch of some specialty coffee, you would probably want to start another cycle with its own set of flavors and aromas. So you might sacrifice a batch of beans on the first pass through, but after that you might, I don't know if they do 10 or 20 or 100 or how many batches they do, recycling this water but you'd want to keep it pretty much the same for uh, one kind of bean or one specialty kind and then this is such a fancy process and it took so long to get it patented and set up as i actually discovered in the 1930s but it wasn't implemented in any plant anywhere until about 1988. so one form of it is called swiss water process it has nothing to do with swiss water or water from switzerland is simply uh, Switzerland is where the process was developed. So abbreviations are SWP, Swiss Water Process, or sometimes just Water Process. So this is patented, it's licensed. There's one plant in the world that does the Swiss Water Process, and it's located in Vancouver and British Columbia in Canada. There's a very similar process called Mountain Water Process, and this actually uses the water from a mountain in Mexico. So they have a patent and it is licensed, and the plant is in Veracruz, Mexico. So you might see mountain water process, you might see Swiss water process. They're very similar, they don't use chemical solvents, they only uh, use activated carbon. So it is uh, considered very healthy and natural and uh, avoids the use of the solvents that uh, so many people object to. And this is, uh, this is the type of uh, process that we'll be tasting today. In the, some of the coffees and lastly super critical carbon dioxide decaffeination is a also a modern process although it's somewhat expensive so again you need steamed or hydrated coffee beans to open up the structure open up the pores and the coffee beans are mostly like wood or cellulose and just needs to be opened up to allow all the solvents or other uh, substances to get in and pull out the uh, caffeine. So in this case, we're mixing it with carbon dioxide under supercritical conditions. This just means that the temperature and pressure are such that there's no difference between liquid and gas. The carbon dioxide that's in here, it's only coffee beans and carbon di dioxide inside this chamber, but the supercritical nature of the carbon dioxide means it has the diffusivity of a gas. It goes into the pores, just like gaseous oxygen or nitrogen or carbon dioxide would. But it has the solvent power and uh, holds the materials that it pulls out 
like a liquid, like a solvent. So it relies on the odd exotic conditions of certain pressure and temperature in here, a high pressure. And that pulls out the caffeine into the carbon dioxide layer. So again, we're doing a sort of a solids liquid separation to get the coffee beans out without the uh, solvent in the caffeine that's been removed, extracted by the carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide just boils off as it becomes a gas again. The caffeine goes on to the pharmaceutical industry and actually the carbon dioxide can be recycled back into the uh, input for this process. But this is equipment intensive. It is expensive equipment. So people generally don't do it for small batches of craft uh, roasteries or small batches of specialty coffee. This is only used for the largest volume decaffeinations and that kind of rules out specialty coffees. This is for the mass market stuff when the company chooses to spend this kind of money.